All right. Um, so now we'll go and solve an example that is associated with the standard linear solid to demonstrate SLS under relaxation. And um, let me put this in words because the problem typically would be worded and we would have to extract the necessary information from that uh, wording of the problem. So a rubber band, let's say, um, rubber, it's a, it's, a, it's a polymeric material, we expect um, viscoelastic material behavior. Um, a rubber band is initially undeformed and it is, um, let's say, subjected to a constant strain epsilon zero at say t equals zero very rapidly okay um so the question is find the history of stress namely find sigma t so here we have a few keywords that we can fall back to so first of all um what all of this is describing so you have a uh, material all of a sudden the strain increases and then remains constant and you want to find the corresponding stress well that's how we describe the relaxation experiment so we understand that we're seeking for the relaxation behavior and now we have to extract a few more keywords that are going to be important for us from this information it says that uh, initially that refers to time equals zero um, it is undeformed. Now, undeformed means, first of all, at time equals zero, so epsilon is a function of time, at time equals zero, the amount of deformation is zero. Let's say zero minus, because at time equals zero, we all of a sudden change the strain, but just a little bit before that, the strain is actually equal to zero. What we expect is that at time equals zero, the viscous strain is also going to be zero because that's going to be something that changes with time. It turns out it cannot jump suddenly because it has to do with the flow of the dash pot. The dash pot is not a spring. It cannot immediately deform. It needs time to deform. It needs time to sustain a certain amount of strain at the material representation of, uh, of, of the dash pot as a rheological element. And therefore, at time equals zero, it's well defined. It is equal to zero. Zero minus is also zero. Zero plus just a little bit afterwards is also zero. Okay, but the strain can experience a jump because there are elastic elements involved in our rheological model. So at zero minus is zero. At zero it jumps and zero plus and afterwards it's equal to epsilon zero. Okay, so and uh, let's go ahead and try to find um, the stress as a function of time. Now I'm going to refer to the equations that we had. Now the first equation um, is the equation that governs the viscous strain. Epsilon is going to be a function of time. Why do we need the viscous strain? Well, because if I know the viscous strain, I can go ahead and calculate the elastic strain, which is the total strain minus the viscous strain. Well, what happens if I know that? Well, then I can go to the stress representation, which says that the total stress is the elastic plus the viscous parts. The elastic part is easy. It's E infinity times epsilon. But the viscous part has the Young's modulus multiplying the elastic strain which is equal to epsilon minus epsilon v. So that's why I need epsilon v ultimately to reach my goal of calculating the stress. So now the strain in general in my equations is a function of time, but now it's a constant. So it's zero. There it's also zero. Okay, and there it is also equal to zero. So I can put zero there. So simplify the equations a tiny bit. Um, so then I look at this differential equation. All right, so looks daunting like every differential equation uh, because you haven't solved that many yet. But it turns out it's almost the simplest you could ever hope for. First of all, it's a linear differential equation. Then 
it is a differential equation with constant coefficients. Then it's an ordinary differential equation. And moreover, the rate, the order is one. You have only one time derivative. The only complication is that the right hand side is not zero, but luckily it's a constant. So instead of a function of time. So it's a uh, first order linear uh, ordinary differential equation uh, with constant coefficients, but which is not homogeneous. So we know that in that case, it, the solution epsilon v as a function of time will have qualitatively a homogeneous part plus a particular solution. The particular solution is a solution that doesn't depend on the initial conditions. Every differential equation needs an initial condition. They are in fact stated here. The particular solution usually found by inspection. In this case, I look, find anything that gives me a solution. I notice that if I pick epsilon v as a particular solution to be epsilon zero, it's constant, so this term would die. Epsilon v is epsilon zero. Both sides are equal to each other, so that works. So why don't I pick it to be epsilon zero? It turns out that's what it is. The homogeneous part, you pick that to be zero, remember, and then you solve it well. The solution is classical, remember, it's equal to a constant times exponential minus t over the constant that you have over here. Well, why do we have a constant? Because we have to match the initial conditions. The initial condition is that at time equals zero, the strain has to be equal to zero. At time equals zero, if I plug in zero there, this becomes one, it's constant plus epsilon zero. And hence I conclude from this that c is equal to minus epsilon zero. So now I can go ahead and plug in minus epsilon zero there and write epsilon v as a function of time, which is epsilon zero, one minus eps e to the minus t over tau, right? Epsilon zero, one minus that value, All right? And that's it. Now, as soon as I know that, I can go in there, subtract that from that and essentially see that the elastic strain varies as such. Good. So now that I have all of that, I can combine that piece of information to reach the ultimate goal of calculating the stress. Always keep the goal in mind. We're looking for the stress for a given strain variation. Um, and therefore, the stress is equal to, if you plug in this value for the elastic strain in there, and just combine everything, you will find that E infinity, first of all, appears in here. Epsilon zero is there. Let's take this into a parentheses of epsilon zero. Plus here there is E, but also multiplying epsilon zero is common, E to the minus T over tau. Okay, so if I want to plot that, what I see is stress as a function of time. Well, let's see. Uh, first of all, at time, a little bit um, to the left of zero, epsilon is actually not epsilon zero, it's zero. So there was nothing. Strain is zero. The stress ultimately is also zero. All of a sudden jump to time equals a little bit after zero. Let's pick it to be zero because this model is valid there. So if this is zero, the value I get is epsilon infinity plus e multiplying epsilon zero. Okay, so it's going to jump immediately to a certain value uh, where the value is sigma of zero, let's say plus if you like, um, is equal to e infinity plus e multiplying epsilon zero. So then as time progresses, there is an exponential decay in some portion of the stress that has to do with the Maxwell element. The stress, the viscous stress, remember, is on the Maxwell element, which is the combination of the spring with the dashpot. That stress decreases and over time it vanishes. And so the stress becomes less and less with time and the ultimately uh, ultimate value that we reach is not zero, but it is rather equal to sigma, let's put in a lousy manner, I'll put infinity there, time goes to infinity, and you get E infinity times 
epsilon 0. And that's why we pick that constant to be E subscript infinity to indicate that that's what it has to do with. So initially very large all of a sudden and then it decays but not to zero but actually to a limiting value. Now it's gonna take forever to reach it to reach exactly this value. It will never reach that value. There is this tiny thing but over time this contribution is gonna become less and less significant and therefore after a while virtually the two lines the dashed green line and the red line they're gonna intersect. So you see again that initially the polymer acts, the viscoelastic material acts initially stiff for a given amount of strain with stiffness that's larger than the larger the, the, the final value which is softer with a smaller uh, Young's modulus. So, in, so um, finally let's say finally soft, right? And this type of behavior um, is exactly what we observed, let me remind you with an earlier slide in a relaxation experiment, okay? And now, that's what we also observe, okay? So, the SLS model is a good model because it can reproduce this. It turns out if you test it with creep, it also displays a behavior that's similar to that, that is left for your um, exercise. Um, now, one simple thing to ask here is, well, Okay, initially, finally, it's going to go to a, fine, a, a softer response. How fast does it take for this decay to occur? Well, how fast does it take? Whenever you have an exponential quantity like this, the factor that scales time here is called a time constant. So here, tau is the thing, the time constant, essentially, that will determine or 1 over the tau is, 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 might be called the time constant, but in any case, it, its value is going to determine how fast this exponential will decay to a final value, or this exponential decays to zero, so this thing reaches a final value. Um, now, qualitatively, even in this case, if you were to ask me how large is tau, this is the time scale, I would tell you, and I could tell you, that tau roughly falls, right? There is an immediate response, and then it decays visibly over this period. I'll pick some value over here, order of magnitude-wise. This point in time, this value, the value, the time it takes for the stress to decay to that value, order of magnitudes-wise, just visually. This is not some particular value, it's not half or anything. It's just that there is some appreciable decay, not full decay, but some appreciable decay, and the amount of that time that, take, that, that it takes for that to happen is of the order of uh, tau. Might be half as much, one-fifth as much, five times as much, whatever, but it's just going to give you an idea whether it's going to take seconds, or hours, or milliseconds. Okay, So, very small relaxation time, is going to make this curve so steep and decay to zero, you will barely be able to observe this decay because when this thing is very small, it would shift right, decay would occur extremely fast, you wouldn't really see it decay. It would be as though it jumped and then came back, you didn't even notice it. It would be like a always soft material. If it is very, very large, it would go up, would take so much time to decay, to the finally soft response, it would take so much time for this exponential to vanish if tau is very, very large that it would act as if it's always stiff, right? So now when you can observe it, the response time is of the order of your, let me say, uh, of, of your scale with respect to measurement. You can sense that variation. And to give you an example of what that response time means, here I have two specimens. And these two specimens are both polymers, and hence they are both um, actually viscoelastic. And on the other hand, one is elastic, more close, you'll see, more close to being elastic, the other one more strongly viscoelastic. What do I mean by that? I mean that you'll be able to observe um, the relaxation time quite accurately. Now, uh, it gives us a relaxation time, gives us an idea about the characteristic response time of the material. Doesn't have to be a relaxation experiment, could be a creep experiment, we could also observe it there. So in this case, what I'm going to do is, 
I will take these uh, tiny columns and I'm going to compress them both. Okay. So this is neither a relaxation nor a creep experiment in the classical sense. But what I'm going to do is I first compress it so the initial conditions are not quite what I told you because it's not initially undeformed. They are both initially deformed. So there's strange boundary condition, initial conditions. Certainly we could formulate them, but they are not undeformed. They're deformed. And so stress is non-zero. I can feel it in my hands. And the stress is equally large in both hands, so they are initially just as stiff with respect to each other. Uh, but now, I am going to release the force. So the force, or the stress, will be zero um, as a boundary condition. I'm not going to impose anything. So it is more like a strange creep experiment. They will be deforming um, under the action of no net force. Okay, But they will deform anyway. Um, and we'll see how they deform. Now, first of all, I let the right one go. And what you see is, it takes time for it to deform, right? So apparently, the response time of this thing is quite large. It's probably of the order of, if you're watching the video, maybe close to, of the order of 10 seconds, okay? It took about 10 seconds for it to response significantly. Now, 10 seconds, well, with respect to what? Watch here. I'm going to release this one. This one immediately responded. So what's the characteristic response of the time, time of this? So probably less than a second. Whereas this one, it's much, much higher. So the characteristic response time of this, I don't know what it is, but for sure, although I don't know it exactly, it is not smaller than this. It's certainly much, much larger, at least by an order of magnitude. So this one, in fact, responds so fast that it's almost like an ideal elastic material. That's what I meant. Characteristic response time with respect to our observation scale, it's so small that it immediately relaxes, if you like, or immediately creeps. So I don't see anything. That's like an uh, elastic material which, con which, which instantaneously responds to the conditions I impose in it. Whereas this one is taking its time, and that time is considerable. And therefore, I see significant viscoelastic material behavior on the right-hand side. Okay, so uh, that's where viscoelasticity is going to become helpful in helping us work with such materials.